My, my name's Anna Austin. I don't normally introduce myself as the senior pastor's daughter because I usually just PKs like, like to keep that on the hush-hush. Like we don't like people to know that. But for today's particular message, um, I, I wanted to let you know that he is my dad and I want you to know why I'm introducing him as my dad because uh, I want to talk about the father's heart today. Um, I believe that the father is after a lot of people in this room. Um, and I was lucky enough to have a really good father. Um, Some of you may not have been lucky enough to have a really good father as an example of your heavenly father. And I believe that today, before you leave, I'm I'm praying, and I've been praying for you all week, that you will be able to walk out of this room knowing that you have a heavenly father that is perfect and that loves you perfectly and knows how to give good gifts to his children. Amen? Amen. So, again, I just want to thank Pastor Mark because he is an excellent man um, in front of you guys and behind the scenes, and no one can say that more than his family. Um, He's honorable, he is full of integrity, and he loves this church. He loves God with all his heart, and he lives it every day. Um, So I'm I'm thankful he's my dad, and I had that example growing up. Um, So without further ado, I want to um, leave the title of this message blank for a little bit. So if you take notes and you like to title your messages, just leave it blank for a few minutes. Um, I'm going to tell you what the title is, and I have a purpose behind that in a little bit. But I want to talk to you guys about the Father, but I really want to talk to you guys about what it looks like to be a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. And in order to understand that, you first have to understand that all of us, unfortunately, were born spiritually orphaned. Um, that all of us were born without knowing that there was a father that loved us. But thanks be to Jesus who created a way to the father. Um, And so I just want to talk to you guys about what it looks like to have an orphan heart. And eventually I want to show you what it actually means to walk as a son or a daughter of Jesus and the father in heaven. So my first question for you guys um, is where did this orphan heart or orphan spirit for first originate. And I'm, I'm going to do this very quickly. And so I'm going to apologize. I was talking to my husband this week and I told him how many notes I had. And he was like, good Lord. He was like, you could write like a whole series on the amount of notes that you have. And I was like, I know. So I'm going to be like very quick on some of these parts, but I promise I will linger a little bit longer on some of the parts that I really want uh, to touch on. So the origins of the orphan spirit or the orphan heart come from before time even began. Um, And I want you guys to know that the first originator of this was Lucifer himself, that he created and originated this orphan spirit that a lot of us, unfortunately today, carry around with us. Um, So Isaiah 14 says that how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. And I think it's interesting that he was called son of the morning. So at one point, Lucifer in heaven was a son And it goes on to say, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And it goes on to say in Isaiah how he was thrown down from heaven. And so I want you to understand something, that the orphan mind has a value system that insists it can do a much better job than God. Lucifer began this. He said in his heart, literally it says that he purposed in his heart that he would ascend above God, that he would be better than God. And unfortunately, a lot of us today think that we know how to do better than God here on earth. And that is a very close sign of what it looks like to not understand and trust a father who loves you. And so it goes on to say um, later in Genesis, so this is before God created the heavens and the earth, Lucifer was cast down onto the earth. And then we see in Genesis 1 where this orphan spirit is now birthed into humanity. Why? Because the serpent, Lucifer himself, Satan, was in the garden with humanity. And because he couldn't be a son anymore and because he got kicked out of his home, he set his intentions against mankind so that mankind would no longer find a home in Jesus, their heavenly father. This is his purpose is that you would walk away from your heavenly home, your father who loves you, because he created this orphan spirit. So in Genesis 1, I'm just going to read briefly through Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Um, God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. 
And in verse 27, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So we see the origin of humanity. And then in Genesis 2, the Lord gives man a command. He says, you can eat of anything in the garden. Literally, the Father of heaven gave them paradise. If you can imagine perfection, heaven on earth, this is what God gave Adam and Eve. Their inheritance was perfection. It was beautiful. It was everything that God intended life to be for mankind. And God gave them one command. He said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for then you shall surely die. Well, the serpent, cunning as he was, decided, since I'm no longer a son, I'm going to take the first sons and daughters of mankind, and I'm going to turn their hearts against God, thus breeding the orphan spirit. And so it says, in verse 25 of Genesis 2, it says, the man and his, wife were, and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I want you to picture a world without shame because I guarantee you every single person in this room has experienced shame at one point or another. Eden was not that. Eden was where they could live out their life in bliss, no shame. And then the story goes on that the, the, the serpent coerced Adam and Eve and sin entered the world and that orphan spirit unraveled in, in mankind. So Genesis 3 um, says in verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened after they had taken from the fruit which they weren't supposed to. And just a side note, if you're a parent in the room, um, I'm learning this as a new parent. Um, I obviously knew that my parents gave us rules, but until you become a parent, you don't always understand why you have rules um, until you become one. And then you realize that the whole purpose behind rules and telling your kids why not to do something is to keep them safe. Am I right? That you have good intentions in mind when you tell your children not to do something. It is not to withhold anything because as a good parent and as as human and as evil as humans can be, good parents want to give good gifts to their children. It is our purpose in life is to make our children's lives as beautiful as possible, full of purpose, full of exuberance in life, but there are rules because we want them to follow the path of purpose and life and abundance and we want to keep them from the snares of the enemy. So this is God the Father in all of his goodness. It is not God withholding anything from his children. It was God as a father at the very beginning of time saying, there are some rules that you need to follow so that you can live life in all of its fullness. And yet Adam and Eve decided to take things into their own hands because they in that moment did not trust their heavenly father. So in verse seven of chapter three in Genesis, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked, shame. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And then verse eight says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. And you can just underline that because we're gonna come back to that at the end of this message. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So here you have fear and shame entering the world. And so I would say the markers of an orphan heart or an orphan spirit are fear and shame. That you feel that you are ashamed to come before the Holy Father, naked and unashamed, vulnerable in everything that you are and unafraid. And instead, we as humanity tend to hide ourselves from the presence of God. God, I'm not good enough. I can't be in your presence. You saw what I did last weekend. You saw what I did last night. I'm no longer worthy to be in your presence. And this all originated in Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve's newfound freedom had a terrible price tag. They had to live, learn to live on their own outside of their God-given home. So how do you know if you have an orphan spirit? A lot of times an orphan spirit flees from a home. Wherever home is, an orphan spirit tends to say, I don't belong there. There are a lot of stats, I'm sure maybe you know this, and I'm not gonna read all of them, but maybe I'll just read a couple of them. There are a lot of stats on what it looks like for 
uh, children in fatherless homes. And before I read some of these, I just want to say um, there's no shame or condemnation for anybody who um, had to grow up in a fatherless home, um, for any father who walked away from a home. This is the Holy Spirit bringing us back into his home. It is the Holy Spirit bringing us back and saying, I know what you did and I still love you. It is the Holy Spirit saying, I am your good father and I have a better way of living for you. And so when I read these stats, it is to say, there's a way that the world does things and there's a way that the God in heaven does things and it looks a lot better than the world does it. So these are a few stats that just come from all over, government agencies, uh, people who do research into fatherless homes. Um, one of them is children in father absent homes are almost four times more likely to be poor. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services states that fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse. Um, children born to single mothers show higher levels of aggr aggressive behavior than children born to married mothers. 71% um, of high school dropouts are fatherless. Um, and then the last one is 14, a study using a sample of 1,400 rural southern adolescents uh, aged 11 to 18 years investigated the correlation between father absence and self-reported se sexual activity. The results revealed that adolescents in father absent homes were more likely to report being sexually active compared to adolescents living with their fathers. There is a God design on fathers and homes because our heavenly father has called every single one of us who by the way, have all been spiritually orphaned at one point or another, our father in heaven is calling us home. And he says, I have a better way of doing things. I have a better way to, re to restore what was lost, to restore what Lucifer and Satan in the very beginning spread out into humanity. He has a better way to restore you. And because he has a better way, he sent his son, Jesus, his very son, to bridge the gap between your orphan spirit and the father who's calling you home. So how do we spot this orphan heart in ourselves? And you know, like I said, I, I, I wanna clarify that we're all born spiritually orphaned. We have to choose to enter into the home of our heavenly father. That is our choice, that is called free will. So we are born spiritually orphaned and we wander and we wander and we wander until we find the heavenly father who has always been calling us home. So there's a difference between being spiritually orphaned and you've never found the father, but I believe that in Jesus followers and people who have chosen Jesus as our father, I think that there are repercussions either generationally or maybe you were hurt by your father that you carry that into your view of father in heaven. And so I'm here to tell you today that no matter what your past looked like, the Father is calling you home today. No matter who hurt you in your past, I'm telling you that the Father in heaven is perfect giving good gifts to his children. He doesn't give anything but good gifts. I think at the time, sometimes we think, God, is this a good gift? I'm telling you that Jesus does not know how to give bad gifts to his children. And so today, my heart for you is to come home to come home. So how do we identify if we've been living with this orphaned heart? So I have a few things just statistically speaking that typically happens in people who live with this orphan spirit. Um, the first one is that orphans live life as without a home. They, they spiritually speaking live life as if they have nowhere to go, they have nowhere to belong. In the spiritual realm, an orphan is like a wanderer in a barren region. They are unable to find peace, satisfaction, and purpose in life. Insecurity and jealousy tends to be a habit. They feel that sonship must be earned. And if I'm just gonna be very vulnerable and honest with you, this is me. This is the party I live in. That for a lot of years, I have felt like I have to earn my way to the heart of the Father. You see, we, and I'm gonna get into this in a second. So before I jump ahead of myself, I'll keep reading these. But um, orphan hearts repel spiritual children. They tend to divulge in anger and control. And an orphan spirit always leads us away from home or the father's presence because of fear and shame. So here's how spiritual orphans operate in two different ways. So if you're taking notes, 
The first one is rebellion, and the second one is religion. I'm just going to give them to you up front. So you can operate out of rebellion or religion. And this is what I was talking about. Some of us operate, and I'm going to show you a story in the Bible where this is true. Some of us operate out of so much fear and shame that we run from God, that we go the complete opposite of our father and we rebel. And we decide, I know better than God. I'm going to do life the way I want to do life. I'm going to act the way I want to act. My character is going to reflect the world. I'm going to do whatever makes me feel good. A lot of times that breeds in certain types of orphan hearts. However, there's the other side of this. And this is where I feel like I fall into, the religious orphan. The religious orphan can't even view God as a father because they are so busy working to earn his love. They see God as a taskmaster rather than a father that's constantly enslaving us to this is what you have to do and you have to act this way and you have to look like this and you have to go to church so many times and if you're not at church, then you're gonna feel fear and shame because you didn't do what I told you to do and it just, a cycle repeats itself. And so I'm gonna read a story to you and the story is called The Prodigal Son and most of us may have heard the story. If you haven't, I think it's eye-opening I think the title, and I think Pastor Mark has said this over the last few months in one of his messages, but the title I don't think should be The Prodigal Son. I think it should be called The Restoring Father because the story talks a whole lot about the sons, but the whole object of the story is the father's love. And so as I read this story, I want you to begin to ask the Holy Spirit do I fall into one of these categories? Am I rebellious to the point where I won't even see you as a father because I'm so scared to come into your presence that you're gonna discipline me and beat me to death? Or am I gonna be one of the parties in the religious spirit where I'm gonna work my butt off for the rest of my life and never understand the intimacy of the father who doesn't ask us to work for his grace and his love? Which party do we find ourselves in? So if you guys would turn to Luke 15, I'm gonna land here for the most of the rest of the message today. Luke 15, verse 11. And it says, and he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Here's what you need to realize about just the first couple sentences here. Culturally speaking, and even today, an inheritance wouldn't belong to a son until the father either established his will or he died. And even further speaking, the younger son in Jewish cultures would not have received the full inheritance. He probably would have received a third of the inheritance. So this is the younger son, and he's coming to his father, and he's saying, I want the part of my share now. And what he's essentially saying to the father is, I'm going to live outside of your will, and I wish you were dead. Because I'm asking for something that isn't mine yet. So verse 13 says, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. I think it's interesting the Bible specifically says that it was a distant country. He was trying to get as far away from his father as possible. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and began to, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything to eat. Okay, let's just pause for a second. I don't know how many of you, I mean, we live in East Texas, so I feel like some of you guys have probably been around some pig pens before. They're not pretty, okay? This is not a pretty sight. It is stinky. In fact, my husband and I, um, we were driving through Amarillo recently, and we drove through, I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of cattle in Amarillo, and we were driving through, and we drove past one of the cattle yards, stock yards, and it, I mean, the smell hit us in the face that I was crying. I mean, it was horrible. So same concept here. The stench is horrible. So he has hit the lowest of lows, squandering his father's wealth that he was not supposed to inherit yet. He goes out in loose living, rebels against his father, and ends up in the pig pens. I don't know if you guys know this. This is a side note. This is not the father's will for him. He is completely outside of the father's will to the point that he is begging for the pig food. 
And yet the owner of the pig says, sorry, I'm not even going to give you the pig food. That's the low that he's at right now. So it goes on to say in verse 17, but when he came to his senses, sometimes we have to hit very low lows in our life to come to our senses. And some of you guys have been there and you can attest to a younger generation. Yes, there is a low and you don't want to go there. (laughs) He said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Okay, I want us to underline this little portion right here. Make me as one of your hired men because we're gonna come back to this, but it is, it, it is something that I saw this week for the first time that is life-changing. Make me as one of your hired men. Verse 20, he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He just prepared this speech for his father. Can you imagine he's walking home? He knows what he's got to say. He's, he's to the point where he's going to beg his father to make him like a hired hand. Just make me one of your slaves is essentially what he's about to go beg his father to do because he knows how he has dishonored his father. And yet, he can't even finish the sentence that he rehearsed in the previous two verses. He just gets to the point where he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then this is what happens in verse 22. The father said to his slaves, quickly. It's like the father knew he was about to ask and beg to just be made a slave. And the good father and all of his grace looks at the son before he can even ask to be a slave and says, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. You see, just like the good father in the story, your father is not asking you to come and be a slave in his family. No matter what you've done, no matter what speech you've rehearsed to come back into the father's fold, he is already welcoming you with warm embrace. And he is saying, I don't want you to be a slave. I don't want you to be a servant. In fact, you are my son and you are an heir to all the goodness that I have. And that's your legacy in Jesus. So here's the story of the youngest son who was rebellious. But what about the older son? Because the story goes on, it talks about the next son. And the next son is what I would like to say falls into this religious camp. Okay, so we continue the story in verse 25. And it says, now his older son was in the field. You can underline that because that's very important. The older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Verse 28, but the older son became angry and was not willing to go in. And the father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. I want you to notice something about this exchange between the older son and his father. The older son never refers to his father as father. He starts this little argument with him and he never calls him father. So we have the rebellious son, and and I'm going to say this, I actually think that the religious son and those of us who have lived as if God is a taskmaster have a harder time coming back into the home of a father than those who have squandered their living and all humility have to come back to their father. I actually think that it might be tougher for those of us with religious spirits to come back to the father than those of us who have rebelled. 
And the reason is because here's the older son. He's at home. He has everything that the father has. And the father has clearly made it apparent to him that he can have whatever the father has. But it was an attitude of his heart. Just like I told you in verse 25, now his older son was in the field. You see, the older son lived with the father, but he was never in proximity to the father. He knew the father, but he didn't know the father was a father to him. He was out in the field slaving. And instead of coming to the father and realizing that the father had everything for him, that he was a true son, and everything at the father's was his, he worked in the fields to earn his father's love. You see, there's a difference between knowing there's a father and believing he's a father to us. I don't know about you, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I spent a lot of years thinking that God, you're good, and I know you're a good father, but I don't see the things that you're doing for me. I believe that you're a miracle worker, but God, would you really work a miracle in my life? I believe that you restore people, but God, can you do that for me? And a lot of us live this way, that we know that there's a father, but we're actually just not sure whether it is that we don't believe that he's good or that we don't trust him but we don't believe that he would do it for us. And there's a big difference in that. So how do we heal from this? How do we, if we've identified that, man, I fall into that religious camp or I fall into that rebellious camp, I've been running from God for many years. How do we heal? And I have one simple answer. We come back into the presence of the Father we come back into the presence of the father. You see, the rebellious son ran to a distant country, as far away from the father as he could. The older son was working the fields. He wasn't in proximity to the father. He was slaving, trying to earn the, the father's love. And then we can go all the way back to the beginning of time where Adam and Eve are in the garden and God is walking in the garden and he says, where are you? And they were so ashamed and so afraid that they hid from the presence of God. You see, only the love of the Father can cast away an orphan spirit. Only the love of the Father can cast out an orphan spirit. The way I came about this message, um, so we have a five-month-old, and she does not sleep, so I'm up, like, all the time. Um, so 1 a.m., 3 a.m., 5 a.m., I mean, you name it, I'm probably up. Um, I've experienced over the last few weeks some fear in my own life. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a spirit of fear. I don't know. But just like Joseph, um, I think the father has been showing me that what he, the enemy, has meant for evil, God is turning around for my good. And so through this fear that I've kind of been experiencing it and, and the way I've really experienced it is when I'm up at 3 a.m., you know, the house is like pitch black and I go um, to feed baby girl at three o'clock in the morning, I get this fear that kind of overwhelms me sometimes. And so as I'm sitting in her nursery and in her rocking chair, the Lord has just really been ministering to me and leading me back into his presence. And the verse of scripture that birthed this whole message was 2 Timothy 1.7. And it says, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, or other translations say fear, but of power, love, and discipline. And so why does that verse of scripture birth what I'm telling you today? Well, this verse of scripture actually parallels with a verse of scripture in Romans. Romans 8.15 says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children, we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You see, there's a lot of darkness in this world. There's a lot of things that are leading us away from the Father's heart. But I'm here to tell you 
that those spirits are not from God. That God did not give us the spirit of fear. He didn't give us a spirit of slavery. The only thing that he came to do was to bridge the gap between being orphans and alone, sending Jesus, his only son, to connect us back to the Father. And that's his grand story, is that we were once lost, but now we are found because of Jesus Christ. And we don't have to feel fear because we are heirs of God. And if you're heirs of God, you're heirs of all the goodness, the peace, the love, the joy, the things that he produces, we are heirs of now. Hebrews 4, 15, and I, I'll share a brief story about this passage of scripture and why it's here. My dad, I had a good earthly father. Um, obviously not perfect, he will admit that. <laughs> um, but I had a good earthly father. And one of the things that my dad always used to say, you know, my dad became a senior pastor in 1992. That was the same year I was born. Um, so I've been a PK for all 31 and a half years of my life. Um, yeah, woo. <laughs> and so you get under the spotlight a lot as a PK and you, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain it unless you've lived the life, but a lot of times you feel like um, you're not good enough or you don't deserve to be in your father's presence. I don't know where that comes from. But I remember growing up, my dad, you know, there's a lot of you in this room, probably close to eight or 900 people in this room. And a lot of people want to meet with the pastor. And I remember my dad always telling us, you know, I won't be able to meet with every person in the church, but my kids, me and my brother, he always told us that his door was open to us. We never had to knock. We never had to set up an appointment with our dad. We never had to be good enough to be in his presence. But one of the things my dad always said was, my door is open to you anytime, anywhere, any place. And I think that that is a beautiful picture of a good father. Hebrews 4.15 says, we do, not, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. That another word for that in another translation is boldness. Let us draw near with boldness to the throne of grace. The Father's door today and every day is open to you. I love what Pastor Daniel said this morning, that if you will just seek him, you will find him. That if you will knock, the door will be open to you. Your father is not hiding from you and he's not trying to get you to earn your way to him. His door is wide open and he's saying, if you would just knock, if you would just come to me, you would find me. And somebody in this room needs to hear that because you had a dad who didn't let you come into his presence without having to earn it. And your father in heaven doesn't make you earn it. In fact, his grace covered everything that you already did and you are washed clean in him because of Jesus, his son. That's how much he loves you. So the problem is not in the grace of God, but it's in our inability to walk, talk, think, and feel like a son and a daughter. The grace of God is there, it's abundant. Now we have the responsibility and the invitation to accept the daughtership, the sonship of our almighty God. And it's waiting for you. You just have to open your hands and receive it. So what is the outcome of coming home? And I've got four points, and then I'm gonna try and wrap this up as quickly as possible. <laughs> but what is the outcome of coming home? And I told you earlier that I wanted to leave the title of this message blank for a purpose. So now you can fill in the title. You can come home. You can come home. For those who have been wandering, trying, earning, just come home. The Father is open to you and the blessings that follow are immense. And so I just wanna cover what, what that looks like. What is the outcome of coming home? Luke 15, we'll go back to the Father. It says, the Father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. So what does this mean? 
the outcome of this son coming home got four things. And they're more than just things. They represent a father's love and what it means to walk in sonship and in daughtership. The first thing that he gave him was a, the best robe. He said, bring the best robe. This means that he didn't just get the robe out of anywhere in his house. It means that that robe came from the father's closet. That was the father's robe. And according to the law, the son deserved death because of how he dishonored his father. But the father, instead of death, gave him the best robe. And what that signifies is the righteousness of God that covers our fear and shame. Because I don't know what the son looked like after he was hanging out in the pig pens, but he probably didn't look that great and there was probably a lot of fear and a lot of shame coming back to the father. I don't know if he even had clothes, but the father said, bring out the best robe. And the, he put the best robe on the son's shoulders, which signified covering of the fear and of the shame. And he said, you are now covered in my righteousness. It is no longer what you did, but now what I did. And you get to walk from that righteousness. It also established the identity of the owner because people knew. It would be like, putting on the king's crown or the king's robe, you walk around with that, people are gonna know who your father is. So this son, now beaten and battered, coming home in fear and shame, is clothed with righteousness. His fear and shame has been covered, and now he walks in the authority of his father. And that's what happens when you come home to Jesus. There is no, there's no shame. There's no condemnation. There's no I told you so. It is the best robe that you can wear. Number two, the ring. He got a ring that he put on his finger and most likely this ring had a family crest on it. So it represented coming back into the flock, coming back into the family. It also represented the power and the authority of the father placed on the son's hand. So now he's walking in righteousness, his fear and his shame are covered and he has the ring of family that shows that who he belongs to is this father. And he has the authority of the Father. I don't know if you know this, but in Matthew, it talks about that, the, that Jesus has given us all authority on heaven and earth. He's given us all authority. We don't have to walk shrinked back like we are some orphan. <laughs> We're a son and a daughter with the, with the power and the authority of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father in heaven. Now we actually get to live like that. And unfortunately, I think this is what has so stood out to me in studying this, is that there are a lot of us who come into this building and we're walking around with our shoulders down, with our heads hunched, because we don't believe that God came for us as a good father. He sent his son, Jesus, so that we could live in the authority of Jesus Christ. And we need to walk out of this room, not as orphans, but as sons and daughters, knowing the authority that's given to us, because you have authority to trample on serpents, you have authority to take ownership of your household. You don't have to walk in fear anymore. You don't have to walk in shame. And that's because of Jesus. Nothing you could ever do could earn that. Just coming into his presence. The, the third thing that the father gave him was his sandals. I think this is beautiful because Jesus gave us a lot of examples of going low. He said, I came to serve, not to be served. And if you remember in the New Testament, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And back then, that would have been a lot nastier than probably today, because today we all have shoes and socks and you know, our feet hopefully stay for the most part clean. Then they wore sandals and would walk miles in the dirt. So their feet were probably disgusting, they probably stunk, they probably had calluses on them, and it just wasn't a pretty sight. But Jesus, in his goodness, chose to get low. He got to the lowest part, the dirtiest part of ourselves, and he washed our feet. So this picture of the sun and the sandals is Jesus saying that I will wholly heal you. I will get down on the dirtiest parts of who you are, and I will heal them, and I will make you holy. And so when you come back into the fold, when you come back into the father's arms and in his, in his embrace, there's no judgment. There's no, well, why did you do that? Or why did you do this? Why didn't you come sooner? He gets down and he embraces the son and he puts on the new shoes and he says, I will wholly heal you. The fourth thing, and I think it's the beautiful, the most beautiful thing, 
as the fattened calf. You see, the father sealed it with a covenant of blood. Just like Jesus came and died on the cross and he shed his blood for you, that covenant of blood represented the son having a permanent place in the house of God. So when you come to Jesus, his blood has covered all of your sin. He has completely healed you. He's put on the robe of righteousness. The fear and the shame is gone. And he so loved you that he gave his one and only son so that you would have the seal and the promise of living with him forever. That is your father in heaven. So you may ask, and I've got a couple of verses here that, you know, it doesn't really close out what happened to the religious son. So some of you guys can relate to this because you have walked away and you've rebelled against God and, and you see, okay, well, the rebellious son, he came home and he got these four things, which I believe the older son got too, because the father literally states that everything I have in this house is yours. So the older son gets this too, but he doesn't close the passage on what happens with the older son. It just kind of leaves us on a cliffhanger. And I think he did that for the Pharisees because the Pharisees were listening to this story and they were like, well, surely Jesus is gonna tell a story that the son's gonna get stoned and he's gonna get everything that he ever wished or that he did, he's gonna get it coming for him. And yet at the very end of the story, they turn to the religious son and he leaves us on a cliffhanger. I think Jesus knew that the Pharisees who were religious knew exactly what he was saying. I think that they were focused on the son, just like religion typically is, focused on our sin and our problems. And yet the story was all about the father. So, because he left us on a cliffhanger, I just wanna give you a couple stories of some religious people that came to know Jesus because of one encounter with their father, Nicodemus and Saul. Both of these men were wealthy and they were religious. They knew all the laws. In fact, Saul persecuted Christians for following Jesus. They were the religious of the religious, the elite. And in John three, we see the story of Nicodemus. It says that there was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. He came to him by night. He was so ashamed to be in the presence of God, probably because he, was, he believed he had to earn his way into the presence of the Father. He was so ashamed he came by night. And I just wanna point out, I'm not gonna read this whole passage, although I wish I could, it's really good. So you can go read it in John three. But I realized this week that Jesus revealed to Nicodemus, the guy who came to him by night because of shame, revealed his plan to him in one of the most famous scriptures, John three sixteen. So when, when you quote John 3, 16, it was actually Jesus talking to Nicodemus. So Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He reveals himself as the son of God. And, and what is crazy is we get left on a little bit of a cliffhanger here. So I had to research this because I was like, well, what happens to Nicodemus? You know, he's this religious man. He has an encounter with Jesus. Jesus reveals his plan to him. And then what happens? 16 chapters later, we see Nicodemus one more time in the Bible. John 19, verse 38 says, Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds in weight. He was at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. So this man, Nicodemus, who first came at night, had an encounter with his heavenly father and was at the foot of Jesus the day that he died. And he not only was at the foot of Jesus, I want you to get this, this is crazy. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about 100 pounds in weight. So I looked up how much this would have cost in today's, in today's money. This would have cost around 150 to $200,000. It also would have been enough aloe and myrrh for anywhere, and there's research kind of runs the gamut on this one, but research says about 100 to 200 burials. He brought so much myrrh and aloe that he could have buried 100 to 200 people and he did it all for, the, for Jesus. This is what the transformation of a loving father will do in our hearts, that we will literally give it all for him. 
We can work and work and work and be, think that God's a taskmaster our entire lives. And then one moment with Jesus changes our life and it becomes less about the task and more about our love for our father because he is so good to us. The other guy that I wanna talk about, super popular, Saul. Later, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Acts 9 is Saul's encounter with a loving father. In Acts 9, it says that he was, he had letters uh, from the high priest basically to go and it says in uh, verse two, he found, if he found anyone belonging to the way, Jesus, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was literally imprisoning believers. Verse three says, as he was traveling, it happened that, it was, that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and it will be told to you what you must do. Verse 19, now several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of God. So here you have two religious men, Nicodemus and Saul. Later, Nicodemus would come and present his gifts at the feet of Jesus and his love for him. And then you have Paul, who Jesus completely changes his identity, like literally changes his name so much that he changes his identity. He's first Saul, he comes to Jesus and he says, now you're Paul. And because of this meeting with a good father, and because of an identity shift in Saul, we see writings from Paul. I mean, just go read the New Testament. Paul probably wrote most of it. But in Galatians 5, this is what Paul says. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. You see, it was for freedom that Christ set me free so that other people could experience this freedom. I'm so, I can just see Paul now where he is just so captivated by the love of the Father. He was into the task and to that, I gotta earn God's love, I gotta do the right things, I gotta follow the law, to now he's been so transformed and so set free that he's like, because of freedom, I'm gonna tell you how to get free. So he lives the rest of his life trying to set other people free in the name of Jesus. This is his story, this is his, this is his inheritance. This is what God purposed in his life to be. It goes on to say in Galatians 5.1, so do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He knew what slavery was, slavery to the law. He said, but don't do it again. In Galatians 4, verse four, it says, when the fullness of time came, this is Paul writing this, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law. So that he might redeem all of us in this room who have been so religious that we feel like we have to earn our way to God. God sent his only son to redeem us back to him, that we don't have to be task people earning God's love. We literally can just come into the full grace of who he is and accept the love that he has for us. He says that we might be receive the adoption as sons, verse six, because you are sons, God sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir through God. So I, I don't, this, this message is hard to preach because truly this is the gospel. You can go from cover to cover in the Bible and read about a good father. So this message is hard to preach because there's a lot of content. So if you're seeking a good father, just go to his word. It's unraveled full of his goodness. And it is a story of how mankind brought in this orphan heart. A good father sent his only son for you. So that at the end of time, you could say, I'm a son and a daughter of the most high king, of a good father. I'm no longer under the task of the enemy. I'm under the lordship of my God. And I had a whole excerpt from a sermon that I wanted to read, but instead I wanna share a story with you that I felt like the Lord really put on my heart. So I was having a conversation with my husband yesterday and you know, sometimes you don't know a person 
unless you really know them. So I am like mega introvert. I don't like being on the platform. Like it is like, oh, I just like feel like I get sick to my stomach thinking about having to be up here all week. And so I was telling my husband this. I was just like, oh, just, ah, I don't want to. <laughs> and he reminded me of a story of my own dad. And he said, you know, your dad has told that story where when he was in college, the Lord, he had an encounter with the Lord and he told the Lord, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just don't call me to preach. And he's told that story. If you've been around, you've probably heard it. And my husband reminded me of that story and he said, what if your dad had said no? What are the effects of that? And so I got to thinking about that and my husband and I just had a really sweet moment because, you know, I obviously don't know what would have happened, but I had to think, you know, well, okay, would me and my husband even be married? Would we be here in Athens, Texas? Would we have our sweet little five-month-old daughter? If my dad had said no to the calling of a good father, generations would have been affected. And so my commission and my call to every person in this room, whether you're a mom or a dad, or someday you'll be a mom or a dad, my call to you is this. Your best yes is obedience to the father because generations are gonna be affected by your yes to a father. And that's why we have to get our orphan hearts right. We have to say, God, you're good. And you're a good father to us. And I know that my earthly father didn't show me that, but I'm gonna trust you as a good father. And I'm gonna believe that your plans are good for me. And I'm gonna say yes to a good father because every single generation after me will be affected by my yes to come into the presence of the father. And that's my commission today to you is to come back to the presence of the father. Can I pray for you guys? You just bow your heads and close your eyes. I feel like this whole week I've been praying for you guys. I didn't know obviously who would be here in this room, but I believe that the Lord, the father in heaven would draw men unto himself, just like he promised in his word. So I believe that whoever's in this room is exactly who needed to be in this room. And it's a picture of the heavenly father running towards you. So I wanna pray for two groups of people that I just have really, I've already been praying for you, but I want this to be a public, bold declaration from you that you say, I received that, I want that. So the first group is you followed Jesus. You're a Christian. You said yes to Jesus a long time ago, or maybe you said yes to Jesus just days ago, but you're carrying around this orphan heart because of humanity. I don't know who hurt you. I don't know who abandoned you, but I believe the father is calling you home and he's saying, I can heal those wounds. I can heal rejection. I can heal abandonment and I'm running towards you today. You took a step to be here and the Father is already meeting you. So if that's you and you're following Jesus, but man, there's some spots in your heart where you just find it really hard to trust him. No one's looking around, I just wanna pray for you and I want this to be your commitment to the Lord that I believe you're a good father. If that's you, would you just throw up your hand? I wanna pray this prayer over you that I wrote this week that I just, man, it was so hard on my heart that I just wanna pray this over you. I pray for those who have been trapped in this orphan spirit. It's time to trust your heavenly father to be good to you. Holy Spirit, would you release those who have been hurt or abandoned? Holy Spirit, would you heal those who have allowed insecurity and anger and resentment and bitterness to be their identity? Holy Spirit, bring them back. Heal those wounds in their heart. Make them a son and a daughter, an heir of all the treasures that you have for them. And we seal it by the blood of Jesus, 
that they will walk out of this room no longer resentful of those who hurt them, but they will walk in the authority of Jesus Christ, their Lord and their Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now I wanna pray for the second group of you. And I believe there are those in this room who you have never come to Jesus because you've been so hurt by man. You have been so orphaned by the world because the world is ugly. And you have never been able to trust the father as a good father because of who knows what. Who knows what kind of hurt you've had to walk through. But I'm here to tell you that there's a good father in heaven that's waiting to welcome you into his home. And there is a home for you. There is a place for you because you belong. And so if that's you and you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he is not a taskmaster. So to pray Lord is not to say, I'm going to do this and do that to earn your love. To pray Lord is to say, God, I want the best. I want your best for me. So I believe you're a good father and I want to come home to you. So if that's you and you want to make Jesus Lord of your life, every head bowed and eye closed, I want to see those hands in this room because I believe they're in here. The Father's calling you home and you can come home. So if that's you and you wanna pray that prayer today, would you just lift up your hand? Just throw it up, nobody's looking around. Thank you, I see you in the back. Thank you, I see you in the right and in the middle. The Father's calling you home. Just pray this prayer, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you sent your son for me. You saw me on that cross. And I've been hurt and I've been abandoned, but I believe you're a good father and you're welcoming me home today. So I trust you to be Lord of my life. I trust you to be a good father. I wanna be an heir of your promises.